welcome to Truth and Lies Radio, a program dedicated to revealing the truth and exposing the lies about the destruction of your freedom and prosperity and what you can do about it. And now, your host, former Washington right-wing activist, international living, banking and asset protection, banking author, and and asset expert, protection author and expert, and, expert, and American in patriot in exile, Finzer. David Finzer. This is David Finzer broadcasting for the next two hours from the Gibraltar of the Balkans, the historic city of Novi Sad, along the banks of the beautiful Danube River here in Serbia, on my 5,242nd day of voluntary exile across six countries in protest from an ever less free America. To comment during the program, you can send me a Skype text message at Truth and Lies Radio, all one word, or you can email me at david at truthandliesradio.com, and your email will pop up right there on that monitor, and I'll be able to answer during the show. Six days from today, our new studio will be finished and operational, and you'll be able to call in toll-free from the U.S. and Canada, or Skype from around the world and join the conversation. Also, don't forget to check out our Facebook and YouTube pages at Truth and Lies Radio Show. According to the big clock on truthandliesradio.com's FATCA slash Taxmageddon Day countdown page, your taxes will skyrocket and your worldwide financial privacy will expire in 132 days, 12 hours, 50 minutes, and 57 seconds. Well, we've now gotten to censorship. I guess they've done about everything else to uh, control the news. The mainstream media is all working together, and now they're using public money and public television with just out-and-out -out censorship. On Sunday, August 12th, Oklahoma's public television channel aired Senator Tom Coburn's town hall meeting in the auditorium of Rogers State University in Claremore. Completely missing from the video were a series of exchanges between Senator Coburn and Tea Party leaders there to, in re to personally refute misinformation that they'd received in letters from the pr senator. Mickey Booth, who I mentioned the other day, who was disappointed with Paul Ryan when she met him, the, the, the new almost god of uh, the Republican Party, who was originally from Hawaii, incidentally, and a founder of the Route 66 Tea Party in Miami, Oklahoma, Jimmy Kreisenbach, OK West Tea Party organizer, and other Tea Party supporters arrived early and took their places in the front row of the auditorium to increase their chances of being called on. Their main goal was to ask the senator to look at all the evidence of forgery and fraud compiled by Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his cold case posse led by Detective Mike Zullo regarding Obama's alleged birth record on the WhiteHouseGov.website. website. Sheriff Opio believes a congressional investigation is warranted. Now, there also have been reports that, uh, that Sheriff Opio is going to present evidence to a grand jury, and there may yet be an October surprise for Mr. Obama that could include a fraud and even treason indictment, which could make things very interesting. But isn't this so funny? They are... They have, it's one thing to ignore the allegations, which the mainstream media is doing, despite the fact they, they, they focus on the, the, Romney, the, the fact that Romney hasn't filed all of his tax records, which is a, a, a so what, but a real key issue of whether or not Barack Hussein Obama II is even legitimately the President of the United States, the mainstream press doesn't mention. That gives one pause on whose side are they on. But now they've gone a step farther. It's one thing to ignore them. It's one thing to make sure that the story doesn't ever appear on their pages or on their, on their television screens. It's another to go in and edit out an entire segment 
of a town hall meeting lest some thinking person hear the truth about what the cold case posse and the Tea Party have to say about Mr. Obama's eligibility. I mean, I'm shocked. I am sure Oklahoma public television gets public support, gets government support. And it also, I'm sure, gets, they always have these fundraisers for public television. And I, if I were living in Oklahoma, which I'm not, fortunately, but I would make sure I would never send another penny to Oklahoma Public Television. I would demand that Oklahoma Public Television replay in prime time the entire town meeting and the segment that they that they omitted. And the very fact that they engaged in this censorship ought to really be front page news on every newspaper and every uh, TV broadcast, news broadcast in Oklahoma because it's censorship of the press. Now, either they did it themselves or someone put them up to it. In either case, it's an abuse of the freedom of the press now, by, because this is a public, this is public television. This isn't private. They're not ignoring. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not ignoring the issue. They are lying. They presented as a complete town meeting something that wasn't. They lied. They lied. They lied, and they ought to be called on it. Now we're going to talk about more lies and rape when we come back in just a few minutes. This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio. Well, the man who says we couldn't have done it ourselves, who lives in that expensive public housing at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, has jumped on the bandwagon to demonize Representative Todd Aiken's remarks about rape by calling uh, where he tried to differentiate between something was really a rape in which a, the a woman's body naturally reacts to prevent pregnancy, which is a medical fact, although I don't think Obama would know a fact if it jumped up and bit him in his butt, uh, verse in, into something, he, he used the wrong word, he used the word legitimate, uh, and he, so he call, uh, Obama has called it offensive. Now, this is from the president who's the biggest liar probably in recorded history, who has more secrets than anyone else, who claims more power than anyone else, and of course he wants to tie it somehow to the GOP presidential ticket while Todd Aiken is running for is a Republican candidate for Senate um, so he still ties together so in a great pronouncement that's worthy of such a great mind Obama said rape is rape gee I you know that's that's just so profound actually it's so shallow it just makes me want to laugh uh, he also called Aiken's comments way out there. This is just great presidential speech. This is the kind of stuff that is going to go down in the history books, the books of quotes along with the only thing we have to fear is fear ourselves, is fear itself. Or Mr. Gorbachev, tear the wall down. No, it's not. This guy is going to be forgotten and thrown on the ash heap of history. He went on to say, defining rape, quote, doesn't make sense to the American people and it doesn't make sense to me. Well, if you don't define rape, you damned fool, then you can't prosecute someone for it, can you? Or you can't even discuss the subject. But you see, that's what the left does. They want to play with definitions. And anyone who's engaged in debates will know that if you let your opponent define the words, they automatically win the debate. So he's playing games. He went on to say what I think these comments do is underscore why we shouldn't have a bunch of politicians, the majority of whom are men, making decisions that affect the health of women. That was not the subject at all. Of course, I don't think we should have a bunch of politicians, uh, uh, whether they're men, women, transgendered, or Martians, making decisions that affect anybody's health. They should leave us all the hell alone. The Democrats, of course, have now tried to do this to gin up the feminazi vote and, and the, uh, all of the pro-murdering baby people 
and get them all on their side and pounce on Aiken, who was go way ahead of Senator Claire McCaskill, um, and he was the favorite in the in the Missouri Senate race. But because he misspoke, which is what he admitted, using the word legitimate rape, meaning a real rape, the uh, they have all pounced on him from the Democrat side. And if as long as they're going to keep on talking about it, I'm going to keep exposing the lies. Aiken said nothing wrong. He could have chosen better words. So he's not Ronald Reagan. He's not the great communicator. But he's also not the great buffoon or his imperial majesty who reigns at the White House. He made perfect sense to those who understand the English language. But with the public school system in America, I can understand why maybe people couldn't understand it. Now, having said that, the Republican Party is not one damn bit better. Republicans are increasing pressure on Todd Aiken to drop out of the Missouri race as concerns mount that his determination could cost them a seat and ultimately control of the upper chamber. Right, let's bring somebody else in at the last minute, someone who is probably more acceptable to the Republican National Senatorial Committee, and that way you can lose the race anyway and ruin this guy's career and offer him up as a sacrifice on the altar of feminazism and the altar of political correctness and the altar of in, in entrenched ignorance. Party leaders from the National Republican Senatorial Committee Chairman Senator John Corwin, who's a Republican of Texas, to Senator Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, whom I don't like a damn bit, along with prominent conservative conservative bloggers, urged Aiken to consider what's best for himself and his party. Well that's to tell the truth and stand up for the truth, not to run and hide and pretend you're a criminal that you've done something wrong when you're not. In most, in possibly the most damning development, the sources say that Cornyn contacted Aiken and indicated that were he to remain in the race, the National Republican Senatorial Committee would not invest a planned five million dollars in the contest. Now, if I were living in Oklahoma, which I guess again, I'm, I'm glad I'm not. Excuse me, Missouri. Um, I would tell the National Republican Committee to shove it that we decide ourselves who we want to have as our senator. You know, he, Cornyn says I recognize this is a difficult time for him, but over the next 24 hours, there's there's a there's a threat right there. That's an ultimatum. Congressman Aiken should carefully consider what's best for him, his family, the Republican Party, and the values he cares about and has fought for throughout his career in public service. Yeah, in other words, shut up and fall on your sword, even though you've done nothing wrong to get the leftists, the feminazis, the politically correct crowd off your back. And then to further stab the knife, stab the knife one more Brutus, you know, George W. Bush, supreme strategist, supremo, Karl Rove, said at Crossroads GPS, the super PAC he co-founded, that had already invested more than $5 million in the race, confirmed that it would be pulling out all the rest of the money they had invested, uh, planned on investing in Missouri, because if Aiken doesn't pull out. Aiken was considered one of the party's best chances of picking up a seat. Multiple polls showed him leading the incumbent, and of course Republicans need to, a net gain of four seats if Obama wins re-election to take control of the upper chamber. They only need three seats if uh, Romney wins because Mr. Ryan will be there when they let, when they let him out of the uh, Naval Observatory, the vice presidential residence, to break, the, to break a tie, <clears throat> which is about the only thing a vice president seems to be good for these days. Now... Everybody is piling on this poor guy, and who is standing up for the truth? Is there anybody but me out there doing this? This is just absolutely ridiculous. This comes from the party, the, 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 both parties that have said and done terrible things. The Democratic Party have said 
all kinds of offensive things about all kinds of people. They accuse anybody they don't like of racism, or that in fact they are the most racist party that exists, which about which I'll speak later. And they get away with it. They, but if this man didn't, he didn't make a racist comment. He didn't make an anti-woman comment. He made a pro-life comment and actually was speaking on a narrow medical issue and they have torn him to shreds over it. And I, as you can probably tell from my very calm and gentle demeanor, am outraged over it. You know, this is the problem with politics. If you can't say it in a 14-second soundbite, you, then you lose. When, because that's the average attention span that the average American voter has. And the press plays on that. So they work for the, you know, the uh, press officers, the speechwriters, work for days and days pounding into the heads of these candidates. And of course, the emptier the head of the candidate, the easier it is to pound new stuff into their head because they don't have anything rolling around in there anyway to interrupt it. And unfortunately, Mr. Aiken had actually thought this through, consulted people, and knew the, thing, the subject about which he was speaking. But if you can just get them to talk about platitudes, if you can get them to be a celebrity like Barack Hussein Obama II, then the press loves it because it's convenient for them. It's easy. They don't have to think. They can just hear pretty words. You know, we're moving forward. We're saving old people. We're saving the universe. I mean, I haven't quite got there. They're just saving the world right now. But of course, as I've said before, I thought that was done 2,000 years ago. Um, nevertheless, this man is being crucified being f by the Democrats and thrown to the lions in the arena by, the, by his own party, the Republicans, which proved to me that they're once again, after, it's just one of a thousand examples I could use, but it's the one that's most public right now, that there really is no difference between the Democrat and Republican Party. The one is a little to the left of the other, but they are just like the communists and the Nazis. They want power at any cost. It's just a matter of which way they choose to go to get it. When we come back, I'll illustrate even more ways that the presidential candidates are really the same person. This is David Finzer. We'll be right back. Well, we've been looking at this election, and I have been saying that there isn't any difference between the two parties. And I think this graphic, for those of you who are watching the video cast, make it pretty plain exactly how I feel. I had that done by our, <coughs> our in-house graphic artist. And I found something in Right Side News today, and I don't always agree with them, but sometimes they have some really good stories, and this was one of them that were from which I have borrowed liberally uh, today. In, liberally in the se kind of nicest sense of the word. Liberally uh, is liberally, like rape is rape, I guess. I don't know. Anyway. Um, but Republicans, of course, are being told, and conservatives are being told they have no choice but to vote for Romney because otherwise they get another four years of the Antichrist Obama. This lesser of two evils crap comes out every four years. We're told we must vote for one horrible candidate because the other guy is even worse. But millions and millions of Americans are getting sick of this. That's why I think that they are projecting that as many as 90 million Americans of voting age will not vote this year, myself being one of them. Barack Obama has been so horrible as a president that it's hard to put it into words. But the truth is that Mitt Romney would be just like Obama, except he probably wouldn't be as much of a thug. There are those dreaming of some major change in direction if Romney's elected, Especially with this, this new savior, Paul Ryan, who, of course, I've commented and continue to point out, has spent his entire life 
adult life as a Washington insider, has never had a real job. He's just one more Republican politician who voted for TARP and a whole bunch of other things, uh, the uh, Patriot Act, the NDAA, preventing removing t Section 1021 from the NBAA. So he's no damn good either. But the following are 40 ways, 40, 40, that Barack Obama and Mitt Romney are essentially the same candidate. Both of them supported TARP, the big bank bailout. Mitt Romney supported Barack Obama's economic stimulus packages. Romney says that Obama's bailout of the auto industry was actually his idea. That's sort of like Al Gore saying, well, he invented the Internet. Neither candidate supports the immediate balancing of the federal budget. In fact, the Republicans, who are the supposedly the budget hawks, are still talking about only balancing the federal budget in 28 years. That's, uh, I mean, that... For anyone to even make that statement with a straight face that they know what's going to happen, that's 14 Congresses, 14 sessions of Congress in the future that somehow they, what they're going to do now is going to bind 14, 14 Congresses to balance the budget. The Constitution of the United States doesn't even seem to bind the Congress. So why would they think that their budget is going to find it? So this projection of balancing the budget in 28 years is a joke. They both believe in big government. They both have a track record of being big spenders while in office. Romney's just saying he can operate it better because he's been a businessman. He can operate it more efficiently. I don't want big government operated more efficiently. I want big government gone. I want it out of my life. I want it destroyed. I want it dead. I want every, every uh, agency of the United States government that you cannot find in black and white in the United States Constitution gone. Both Barack Obama and Mitt Romney fully support the Federal Reserve System, the private bank that issues America's money, and now it doesn't even have to print it anymore. They just make it electronically. One of the biggest crooked schemes in the history, or the recorded history of the world, and they're both in favor of it. Both Obama and Romney are on record as saying that the president should not question the independence of the Federal Reserve. Great! Of course not. We give over control of America's economy to the private bankers. These are banks that have been caught defrauding their own customers, the co that launder mo drug money, um, that engage in every kind of evil around the world, and they own the Federal Reserve, and they, their independence shouldn't be questioned. If we're going to print money, for which there is no constitutional mandate, because Congress has the mandate to coin money, not to print it, then it sure as hell shouldn't be independent. Both of them have said the Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke did a good job during the last financial crisis. Look in your wallet and tell me how, if you agree with that. Both of them felt that Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke deserved to be renominated for a second term. Ditto my previous comment. Both candidates oppose a full audit of the Federal Reserve. Why? You and I get audited by the IRS. We have to tell them everything. <clears throat> Come January 1st, 2013, next year, not very many months away, with, with the FATCA rules, we're going to have to tell them where we everything we have everywhere in the world, but we shouldn't audit the Federal Reserve and f see where the money's gone. Both candidates are on record as saying that Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner has done a good job. What are they, on drugs? Obama and Romney have both been big promoters of universal health care. In fact, Obamacare was based on Romney care. Romney was the one who developed that plan. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Wall Street, the big banks, the big multinational corporations, those who want to crush small and medium-sized enterprises, who want to crush the little man, the middle, the, the, <coughs> the middle class, is showering both 
candidates with huge campaign contributions. So whichever side wins, of course, they'll have access and it'll be the same thing with just a different name. Neither candidate wants to eliminate the income tax or the Infernal Revenue Service. Both candidates want to keep personal income tax rates at exactly the same levels for the vast majority of Americans. Both candidates are open to the idea of imposing a value-added tax on the American people, a national sales tax in addition. Both believe the TSA is doing a good job. Both supported the NDAA. Both supported the renewal of the Patriot Act. Barack, both believe that the federal government should be able to indefinitely detain American citizens that are considered to be terrorists. I'll give you the rest of the list when I come back in just a few minutes. But this, they are one and the same. It is Obamni that neither of them is a choice. Well, before we left for the commercials, I was going through the list of how o Obama and Romney are really the same candidate, just with different faces. And I'd gotten over through a little, past a little bit of half of the list. I'm going to continue the list. I'm going to keep going. Both candidates believe that American citizens suspected of being terrorists can be killed by the president without a trial. Obama has not closed Guantanamo Bay as he promised, and Mitt Romney actually wants to double the number of prisoners held there. Both candidates support the practice of extraordinary rendition. Now, you may not have heard that word. That means kidnapping. In other words, legalized kidnapping. If you can't, get, if you can't extradite someone, you kidnap them. Gee, isn't that great? Government's breaking the law, and then but they arrest us for breaking the law. They both support the job-killing, phony free trade agenda of the global elite, which isn't really free trade at all, but is only it is um, protected trade for the big multinational companies. They both accuse each other of shipping jobs out of the country, and both of them are right about the other. Both are extremely soft on illegal immigration. Neither candidate has any military experience whatsoever. I'm not sure they even know how to use a gun. This is the first time this has happened in a U.S. election since 1944. Both candidates earned a degree from Harvard University. The very fact that they come from the Ivy League makes me want to throw up. They both believe in the theory of man-made global warming. They probably also both believe in the Easter Bunny because the two have about the same credibility. Mitt Romney has said he will support a cap-and-trade carbon tax scheme like the one Obama wants as long as the entire globe goes along with it. Gee, isn't that nice? He's bringing everybody together. Both candidates have a long record of supporting very strict gun control measures. In other words, they don't want us armed, but they want weather men armed. They want Social Security men armed. Pretty soon they're going to be arming your post, but I guess if you misaddress a letter, they get to shoot you. Both candidates have been pro-abortion most of their careers. Romney's conversion to pro-life only came after he decided to run for president. Both believe that the Boy Scout ban on openly gay troop leaders is wrong. The Boy Scouts are a private organization. It's none of, you know, they, they have been targeted. It's none of their damn business. It's not something a president should speak out on. They both believe that a two-state solution will bring lasting peace between the Palestinians and, Israel's, and, and Israel, even though the Palestinian, the Palestinian Authority constantly declares it's going to destroy and wipe out Israel, the only state with a democratic government in the entire Middle East. Both candidates have a history of nominating extremely liberal judges. Like Obama, Romney also plans to add signing statements to bills when he signs them into law, clarifying, limiting, adding, etc. Just something that was made up somewhere by someone that's totally extra constitutional. They both have a horrible record when it comes to job creation, both believe that the president has the power to take the country to war without getting the approval of the United States Congress, even though the sole power to declare war is vested in the Congress and the Constitution. And finally, both candidates plan to continue running up more government debt, even though the U.S. government is already 
16 trillion dollars in debt. Now, you're in, if you're unhappy with the choice between the big spending Barack Obama and the other big spender Mitt Romney who refuses to outline any significant cuts over the Obama's agenda. If you remember a few days ago we had a chart and compared the uh, difference in the two in the two budgets and over 28 years it was hardly different. In November you might like to have one or more alternatives on the ballot for president who will provide real differences from the major two-party candidates. In fact there are third-party candidates who provide not only a choice instead of an echo for those who see the race between Obama and Romney as picking the lesser of two evils, but these third-party candidates could even help shape the debate and even tilt the election. But even if they don't, they at least offer an alternative for those who cannot in conscience Vote for either Romney or Obama. I could not force my hand to push the button, poke the chad, check the box for either of those two slime balls. It's a factor, these three can't parties, that both Romney and Obama are watching very closely. Time magazine speculated on August 1st that the Constitution Party, which is more of a traditional conservative party, his, the, their nominee, Virgil Good, could cost Mitt Romney the presidency. Good is pulling fully 9% of the Virginia's vote, according to a mid-July public policy polling survey, leaving Obama ahead of Romney 49 to 35. In a tight election where Virginia's 13 electoral college votes could make or break Romney's candidacy, even 2% for Virgil Good could pull enough Republicans away to hand the historically GOP state to Obama in November. Likewise, on the left, Green Party nominee Jill Stein could slice off tens of thousands of key Obama votes. But regardless of who actually wins the election, the constitutional powers of the presidency will continue to be less important than those of Congress, which still possesses all legislative powers, as I keep on reminding you. As important as it may be to elect a constitutionally minded president, electing a good Congress is far more important because Congress controls the purse strings. They don't have to repeal the laws, they simply have to defund, defund them. So. I just want to give you a little bit of a profile of the three presidential candidates most likely to make the ballot in the majority of states. The first, of course, is the Libertarian Party's candidate, former Mexican, New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson. Uh, he was New Mexico Governor from 1995 to 2003 as a Republican and he is campaigning under the campaign slogan, Live Free. When he was, took over as governor of New Mexico, it had a, a, a budget deficit of over a billion bucks. When he left, there was a budget surplus. Johnson has, uh, is a real libertarian. As governor, he was labeled by the Conservative Club for Growth as one of the most anti-spending governors in New Mexico's history. He pledged to, pledges to send a balanced budget proposal to Congress for fiscal 2014, which would be the first budget of his presidency if he were elected. He said he would do this by spending cuts across the board, and then he goes into great detail. On foreign policy, he'd cut military spending, withdraw all U.S. troops from Afghanistan and Europe. The United States has, a, has military bases in 130 countries around the world. He would bring the boys home, boys and girls or ladies. He supports free trade as a foreign policy, generally is, is supportive of NAFTA and WTO, regarding them as successful implementation of his pro-free trade agenda. On civil liberties, Johnson has talks about inalienable rights, and he's the strongest candidate on most ballots in that area in November. Johnson wouldn't have signed the NDAA, is against the Patriot Act, warrantless surveillance, against torture, and is for what he calls due process for terrorist suspects. He does remain open to special military tribunals instead of a civilian trial by jury for certain terrorist suspects, however, 
And most importantly, I think Johnson's a solid supporter of the Second Amendment and individual right to keep and bear arms. Now, on social issues, he is pro-abortion, on which I have a problem, and he would like to make legal immigration easier. He said we should focus on making it easier and simpler for willing workers to come here with a temporary work visa. He also favors the so-called same-sex marriage recognition, but he indicated he ultimately favors taking marriage out of the hands of the government. The Constitution Party, which is their candidate is Virgil Good, is a traditional conservative. He's limited government, strong military, traditional moral values. Uh, he's voted to cut foreign aid. You know, he he was uh, he's pretty much of a Barry Goldwater conservative, and I think anybody on the uh, solidly conservative side. Uh, would like him. He does strongly oppose multilateral free trade agreements as job killers. Um, he had he he did vote for uh, allowing warrantless searches and a few other things. So, you know, he's he to me he's not as good quite as good on the Constitution as Gary Johnson, but certainly someone who's acceptable, especially the pro-lifers. The third one, of course, is Dr. Jill Stein who is the Green Party, and you know their agenda. The only good thing about them is they are against all of the foreign policy problems that the United States has and are in favor of civil liberties across the board. I would still probably, I would not vote for her, but either of the first two candidates I would. I'll be back in just six minutes, so stay tuned because I've got a lot more to say. This is David Finzer broadcasting for the second hour from the Gibraltar of the Balkans, the historic city of Novi Sad along the banks of the beautiful Danube River here in Serbia on my 5,242nd day of voluntary exile across six countries in protest from an ever less free America. To comment during the program, you can send me a Skype text message at Truth and Lies Radio, all one word, or you can email me at david at truthandliesradio.com and your email will come up right there on the monitor and I'll be able to see it during the show. Six days from now, our studio will be finally be finished and you'll be able to call in toll-free from the U.S. and Canada or Skype from around the world and join the conversation. Also remember to check out our Facebook and YouTube pages at Truth and Lies Radio Show. Well, according to the debt clock, um, on the uh, <clears throat> according to the U.S. debt clock, the total U.S. national debt right now stands just under 16 trillion dollars, which is a debt of almost 51 thousand dollars per citizen and almost 140 thousand per taxpayer, which of course indicates in stark numbers the fact that 49.5% of Americans don't pay income tax. The gross domestic product is lagging by over $600 billion, meaning that if, all, if we took all of the value of goods and services produced in the United States in a whole year, you still couldn't just pay off the national debt. America is broke. And the total U.S. national debt of all kinds is the staggering, humongous, incredible, mountain-sized $57 trillion. That's not going to be paid off in 28 years or 28 lifetimes. And anyone who tells you different, short of a complete return to constitutional government and the abolition of in the words of Phil Graham, all the federal departments that aren't constitutional, it ain't going to happen. Well, you know, it's pretty funny how Mr. Obama, who was talking about how Congressman Aiken was insensitive and accusing him of some, basically some kind of sexism, he was playing the sexism card, is actually on the record publicly a racist. Yes, a racist. The Obama regime filed a brief this week urging the Supreme Court to uphold 
racial preferences and affirmative action in public federally subsidized university admissions claiming that the government has a vital interest in perpetuating the use of race based quotas and that the practice does not violate the US Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. The case, Fisher versus University of Texas, is around a white student who alleged that she was unconstitutionally denied admission due to her race. The plaintiff, Abigail Fisher, claims that in 2008 she suffered from illegal discrimination when the University of Texas at Austin rejected her application in favor of less qualified applicants who happened to be of a so-called minority race. Now, if a university said they didn't want to let someone in because they were black or because they were Hispanic or because they were Asian or because they were American Indian or because they were Polynesian, that would be racism. But if a university chooses not to let someone in because they're white, somehow that's not. Of course it's racism. And in fact, all it does is perpetuate and exacerbate the racial divide in America. In my own life, I can think way back into the 1960s of a perfect example of how this reverse discrimination actually hurts the very minorities it's intended to help. In, at Venice High School, we had our first two black teachers. And the one was a brilliant mathematician. She taught honors calculus. I was in her calculus class. And she was probably the best mathematician I've ever met. She could have taught at any university because she was just that good. She knew her subject inside out, upside down, and was an absolutely great teacher. The second one was an English teacher who couldn't speak English. I'll give you an example because I had a very short experience with her. The first day in her class, she started out the class by saying, and I quote, today we are going to discuss the proper pronunciation, not pronunciation, pronunciation of words. I got up left the room, went to see the principal, and said, transfer me. Now here's the problem. That teacher who was so dumb she didn't know how to pronounce pronunci pronunciation makes it look like both teachers got their job because of their race. There ought to be one standard for everyone. We, the government especially should be colorblind. To do anything else is racist, and we'll talk more about it. You know, they've argued that America enter, had entered a post-racial era with the election of Mr. Obama. But now, lawyers from five federal departments have co-signed the brief along with the Injustice Department, essentially arguing that an applicant's race can offer insight into his or her potential value to the government and higher education institutions. So now race has a value? Now if a white person said that, that would be racism. But the government saying it in favor of a black person, it's not. They go on to say race is one of the many characteristics, including socioeconomic status, work experience, and other factors that admissions officials may t consider in evaluating the contributions that an applicant would make to the university. Well, they're wrong on two cases. First of all, they're wrong on race, because race is not a characteristic that determines suitability. Second, socioeconomic status is not a, 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 a proper uh, a, a proper uh, criteria criterion for considering admission. I came from a very poor family and have done not too badly in my life. Other work experience and other factors. Other factors. Who knows what are the other factors? But you know, race they say is one of the number of contextual factors that provide a more complete understanding of the applicant's record and experiences. So, in other words, race 
does make people different. This is what the government is saying. This is blatant, absolute, and complete racism. The Supreme Court last ruled on the issue of racial quotas in university admissions almost 10 years ago when, by a narrow 5-4 to four vote, the Supreme Court sided with the University of Michigan's use of race as a criterion for admissions in the Grutter v. Bollinger case. According to the 5-4 to four ruling, the government has a, quote, compelling interest in relying on racial preferences to advance so-called diversity. So affirmative action is constitutional. Tell me where in the Constitution the word diversity appears. I'm sorry. It doesn't. The Constitution, one of the greatest documents in the history of the world, was written by a bunch of white men. I don't think they used diversity. The biggest diversity was whether they were Catholic or Protestant and what kind of Protestant they were or whether they were Quakers or deists. Come on. This is, this is liberal crap that they have come up with that uh, is just one more way to create special rights for special people. And this is a way to, to gather votes together and force us all into groups based on the pseudoscience of sociology. I'm sorry, I reject it. I believe that every individual is a unique being created in the image and the likeness of God. Red, brown, yellow, black, white, as it says in the children's church song, all are precious in his sight and all deserve equal protection of the law. Obama is a racist, his regime is racist, his attorney general is the most racist attorney general in modern times, and the high court has a chance in February, when they hear the case, to reverse this racist policy. But speaking of racism, there's another kind of racism that has been around for a long time and is virulent, virulently anti-Semitic. There is a book, and I, I hesitate to dignify it with the word book, called The Protocols or The Secret Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Sometimes the names change slightly. Now, this violently anti-Jewish book, which talks about a worldwide Jewish conspiracy, is available as an application on both the Apple iTunes and Android marketplaces, according to a report by the Mideastern Research Institute. For just 99 cents, iPhone users can download this hate-filled protocols from the education section of Apple's online marketing place. Maybe they ought to put a book up on the proper care and treatment of field slaves. That's just about the equivalent of how offensive this is. A portion of the profits from the application sales ostensibly go to Apple, as the developers have a 70-30 split in revenue. The application is also available on Android smartphones at no cost. The sale of this very old anti-Semitic diatribe has drawn attacks from several Jewish organizations and should draw attacks from Christians and all men of goodwill who have urged the computing giants to ban the applications. I mean, would they, why don't they offer a subscription to white power as well on, their, on Apple and Google? Why don't they do that? Why don't they, you know, just go ahead and put all the racist, skinhead, evil, terrible stuff to talk about mud people up there? We, they can sell those too and maybe make some money on that. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is, is old. It purport, purports to reveal the ways in which the Jewish people control the international monetary system as well as politics and foreign policy. Though this has been completely discredited in the Western world, this anti-Semitic book is still heavily circulated throughout the Middle East and Arab countries. 
one Android version of the protocols, which includes images of swastikas, Hitler's Hakenkreuz, has been downloaded by users between 500 and 1,000 times, according to the report. <clears throat> Another English version of the application that can be accessed from Google Play via an Android smartphone is currently on sale for $1. The description, listen to this description. Quote, the document known as the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion is one of the most important documents ever to come to light in the world. In fact, it can be described as the blueprint for the domination of the world by a secret brotherhood. Yep, when in doubt, blame it on the Jews. It worked for Hitler, so I guess it should be trotted out now to be used against the Jewish people. This is absolute infamous. This is anti-Semitism at its worst. If they're going to include that, then they need to add Martin Luther's book, The Jews and Their Lies, which is one more vicious, evil, anti-Semitic book. Then they need to include every, every racist, anti-Semitic, just terrible book or writing that's out there like i said they ought to, they ought to uh offer the uh, free downloads of uh, the white power newspapers and the skinhead newspapers and then maybe something from the uh, new black panther party too i mean let's get in on that how about the uh <clears throat> the black muslims who attack the jews is this what the country is becoming is this the america that we want is is Google, do Google and Android, uh, do um, Google and Apple, are their profits so small that they cannot make a moral decision and say, no, we choose not to do this? Now, I don't propose the banning of these books because I don't want to ban any book. These things, this thing will fall on its own. I've read through it. It is trash. You have to have the IQ of a mongoloid to believe it. You have to be a hater to believe it. You have to somehow believe that um, Jews are some kind of evil supermen that, like Hitler called them, even though he called them Untermensch, subhumans, you re really have to be, have that kind of a mindset to buy into this at all. But there are thousands of people out there who do. And there are people all over the Middle East who believe this stuff. And what's amazing, of course, is these same people who, if you so much as drop a copy of the Quran onto the ground, will start a riot. Now, where is the fairness? Where is the justice? Apple and Google owe an apology to the Jewish people who have already suffered in the last century more than anyone deserves to be suffered. Of course, these are the same people who also deny the Holocaust. And, um, you know, I just think it's, it, it's incredible and... I'm angry about it, and I'm going to be writing some things to Apple and to uh, Google about it. Anyway, stay tuned. When we come back, we'll talk about reasons the U.S. will collapse, at least according to a Russian professor. This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio. Well, I'm back, and I've already been accused of political incorrectness because I said someone who believed in the, learn the protocols of Zion had to be a mongoloid. Mongoloid traditionally mean, what meant someone who is mentally defective, a very low IQ. I guess now it is politically incorrect and considered offensive. Well, I intended it to be offensive because anyone who believes in the learned, the, the, the truth of the book, the learned elders, the protocols of the learned elders of Zion is an idiot a moron, a jackass, a racist, a person without reasoning power, and if I could think of any other offensive words right now that I could say on the radio, I would say them. They are basically pond scum. Anyway.
Moving on from there to a different issue that's sort of interesting. Reasons why the U.S. will collapse. Every great nation has its season. No great civilization in history has ever declined as much as America has and ever recovered from that decline. At some point, every great nation ceases to be a world power and becomes nothing more than a page in a history book. America will crumble because attempts to revolt will be stifled. That's why they're arming po everybody but the postman, and that's next. America will crumble because the surrounding nations are more educated and intelligent. I mean, I've talked to people here in Serbia who've been exchange students in the United States. And they go from high school here to high school there and find that they don't have to do anything because they're years ahead in their studies. The only thing they do is improve their English. I know one young man here whose first name is Stefan, whose English is so good I could drop him into California and you would think he was from the San Fernando Valley. If I could just get him to stop calling me dude, it would be great because he really does sound like an American. But you talk to the people here, and they are well-educated. They even know where America is, like how many Americans know where Serbia is. How many people think I'm in Siberia? It's hilarious. America will also crumble because more and more people feel entitled. I read this anecdote, which illustrates it firsthand, or secondhand rather, the, the disaster that Amer uh, is America parenting today. Now, I have no right to speak about parenting myself because I have no children, at least as we say in the South, none to speak of. One of the children, probably eight or nine years old, began crying when she did not get her way. Quickly, her dad sped to the scene, consoling the poor, deprived child. This happened shortly before one of the other children played on one of Southwest Airlines' computers. The proud parent seemed delighted that the youngster had ended up, uh, had such an interest in technology. Many kids who are never spanked and never told no end up being parasites. Now, frankly, every time I see an ill-behaved child or an ill-behaved dog, I want to go over and slap the parent or the dog owner because it's their responsibility for molding that child or, in the case of a dog, that dog. I have five dogs. They are very well taken care of, but they're also taught to obey, and as much as you can teach dogs, you know, they're pretty human and behave certainly better than an awful lot of children. How many times have you been on an airplane where there's a kid behind you who kicks your seat for six hours, and you keep on asking the parents to ask them to stop, and they won't? I mean, how many times have you been embarrassed in restaurants? You know, that's, that, that's just one example. The hardworking taxpayers who still have some sense of worth and dignity end up being the host or the co-enablers of these people who feel entitled. And we're not just talking about parents, we're talking about all the people who feel entitled. You know, I'm uh, the people who are entitled because they're part of a minority group. The people who are entitled because they're part of some special group. I guess I'm a twofer. I'm now over 55, so I'm elderly. That makes me part of one protected group. And I'm handicapped, so I'm, that makes me part of another protected group. Let's protect the Crips. Gee, there I just said another terrible word, an absolutely terrible word. I remember one time I went into, in Pinellas County, Florida, in fact, I went in to renew my handicap sticker. And I go rolling it in my wheelchair, because in those days I was still wheelchair bound. Thank God I'm not wheelchair bound anymore most of the time and I went in and I said I'm here to renew my Crip sticker and this fully abled woman behind the counter got outraged and started giving me a lecture that I shouldn't use the word Crip or crippled because it was demeaning and not proper language and I looked at her and I said lady I'm the one who's crippled who the hell are you to tell me what I can call myself? You know, all this po politically correct language does is veil the truth. 
They want to lie to people that everyone is equal. They want to tell handicapped people in particular that we should be able to do everything everybody else can. Well, we can't. But we can, do, we can have full and tremendous lives. And someone without a college education can't, for example, be a, a physician. But he can still have a full a, a, a very full life. I don't have a university degree. I have less than one year in university because they were so communist in 1970 when I started I couldn't stand it. So I made my own way and I worked outside the box. You know, and I have never asked for a handout. I don't need one. And I, I have built a very interesting life for myself with which I'm satisfied. And I don't need politically correct language. I don't need people to to, you know, I'm overweight, so people try to avoid, or, you know, you're not fat, you're, 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 you're plump. No, I was, I, was, I was technically morbidly obese. Now, I've gotten it down to just grossly obese, and we're working on that. I've lost, I've lost a couple of hundred pounds already, uh, believe it or not, and that's what, which is why if you look at my picture and pictures on the Capital Conservator website, it looks a little different because I've lost a lot more weight. But we've raised a generation that's dependent on the state and is going to be crushed by the expectations of life. And those nations that are instilling a work ethic are going to be sure to take advantage of that dependency. I don't know when the end is going to happen, but it will. If America does not change course, we will fall and crumble into pieces. The changes have been gradual, but now that people have been conditioned to accept virtually anything government does in the name of health, safety, or security, the changes will occur ever more quickly. We are at that stage now. One day in the not distant future, America will be a complete tyranny and capitalism, confidentiality, and Christian values will be subjects of nostalgic reflection. I think most of you will agree with me that one of the most useless organizations in the history of the world is the United Nations. It has been a talking shop, but it's also been a place from which, back in the days of the Cold War, the communist nations had a second set of legal spies to spy on America. It gets involved in sponsoring all just about everything we think is wrong in the world. If you ever read the uh, Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations and compare it to the Bill of Rights, you'll find a notable difference. The Constitution of the United States or the, in, in the Bill of Rights says Congress shall make no law prohibiting freedom of speech, religion, etc. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that freedom of speech, religion, etc. shall not be prohibited except by law. Isn't that nice? So it's okay as long as you do it by law. Well, let me give you a particularly egregious example of how this incredibly expensive, wasteful, and evil organization operates. Opponents and liberty-minded activists are up in arms over the fact that genocidal mass murderer, the genocidal mass murderer ruling over Sudan, Sudan, Islamist Omar al-Bashir, is set to be elected to the United Nations Human Rights Council. That's right, the United Nations Human Rights Council. Observers said the move will further discredit an institution that already has become a laughingstock around the world for appointing so many communist and Islamic dictatorships as supposed guardians of human rights. Critics from across the political spectrum are already protesting this latest development and outrage. But the analysts say that with the broad support of governments in the region and the backing of the so-called African Union, and the only thing united about it is that they're united against everybody else, the Sudanese war criminal's appointment to the UN's so-called human rights entity is now virtually assured unless a massive wave of opposition somehow gets organized. But since the UN is such a nothing organization, I, I doubt it's going to happen. Ironically, the UN resolution that created this dubious global rights body stated that, quote, the members elected to the council shall uphold the highest standards in the promotion and protection of human rights, unquote. 
Great. Even using the UN's own questionable definitions of human rights, which are completely alien to the American and British traditions of individual rights, the Council's membership makes an absolute mockery of the resolution and even of the idea of protecting human rights itself. Other regimes represented on the Global Council include some of the most repressive and totalitarian dictators on the planet. Cuba's communists, for example. Saudi Arabia's autocratic Islamists. The only country in the world named after a family. You realize Arabia is called Saudi Arabia because it's owned by the family of Abdulaziz ibn Saud, who was the Osama bin Laden of his day and overthrew the legitimate Hashemite dynasty, which was pro-Western by allying with a strict ultra-Islamist sect, the Wahhabis. It also has included the mass-murdering communist dictatorship ruling over mainland China. These are the ones who wait. If you have an illegal without, uh, second child, one born without permission, they wait until the child is being born and then stick a syringe into the head of the child and inject it with formaldehyde and kill it. Less than 10 years ago, the body was actually chaired by Muammar Gaddafi, the now dead and probably in hell Libyan dictator. Despite that, Sudan's genocidal maniac who seized power in a coup more than two decades ago might possibly just represent a new low in the almost comically discredited United Nations Council, according to many commentators. Al-Bashir, who purports to be a president, has a warrant out for his arrest by the International Criminal Court on charges of war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. But of course, if he is elected to the Human Rights Council, he will then have immunity as an international uh, official. <coughs> The brutal Sudanese dictator is actually the first sitting head of state to ever be subject of an ICC arrest warrant. And since the international process was initiated over the genocidal plans of al-Bashir, masterminded and implemented in the Darfur region, where he was the mass murderer and continues to be, uh, carry out barbaric atrocities against black Christians in the south, the people of the Nuba Mountains and other groups, they still are, want him to be on the Human Rights Council. Just a year after the Human Rights Council sought to get rid finally of the ghosts of the past by suspending uh, Gaddafi's Libya, which infamously chaired the council in 2003 and was re-elected a member in 2010, it's now set to replace him with a tyrant wanted for genocide. Genocide, that's what, where you wipe out entire groups of people were back to Hitler again by the International Criminal Court, said UN Watch Executive Director Hillel Noor, who compared the development to putting Jack the Ripper in charge of a woman's shelter. For how long must we have the inmates running the asylum? <clears throat> well, it is a lunatic asylum. UN Watch, a Geneva-based watchdog that monitors the global institution, called on the U.S. government and the European Union to help defeat al-Bashir's candidacy by promptly announcing their opposition. It also said the UN and the cause of human rights would be severely damaged if the genocidal tyrant was able to secure a seat on the Council. But the US and the European Union aren't going to do anything about it. They like these kind of people. They sell arms to him. They back other tyrannical regimes that are on the Council. They always have. <clears throat> the United Nations historically stands against freedom and in favor of dictatorship. The majority of the states in the United Nations are not free as you and I would have an understanding of freedom. Just because they call themselves a republic and maybe have elections, I mean that's like Montenegro here, been part of former Yugoslavia, the same guy has been elected either president or prime minister for basically 20 years, Milo Djukanovic. He always wins the elections. One time they accidentally uh, released the uh, poll results before the polls had actually closed. 
when they were voting on leave, separating from Serbia, the EU said that uh, they would only accept it if the vote was at least 55%. At the time, I predicted that it would be 55.1, and that's exactly what it was. His elections have always been crooked, and yet he is treated as Montenegro has been cleared for, or has candidate status in the European Union. His gang of thieves steal something like 40% of the gross domestic product of Montenegro. You know, there, this goes on all around the world. The first war the United States ever fought under UN sanction when the Soviets were conveniently absent from the Security Council was the Korean War. And how many lives were lost there that ended up in a stalemate when it, we could have won that war. We were already at, at the bridges at, at the Yalu River, and Harry Truman, who wasn't a very good president, wouldn't let Douglas MacArthur blow up the bridges to stop the Red Chinese from coming into the war. And an awful lot of American families objected to the fact that their sons who died in that war were buried with the UN flag on their coffin rather than the American flag. What does the UN do? It sends peacekeeping forces that immediately get the hell out of the way as soon as the peace begins to break down. It allows these people, all of these countries, to act like they're real countries. It props up states, so-called countries, that have no reality at all. Have any of you ever looked? Look up Gambia. Look up Gambia. Gambia is like 10 miles on either side of the River Gambia, totally surrounded by Senegal. It looks like a snake on the west coast of Africa going straight in from the coast. That has the same vote in the UN as the United Nations or Russia or Red China or India or the United Kingdom or other real countries, real countries whether you like it or not. I mean, the General Assembly is a joke. Well, we're now at the end of the two hours, and I guess I'll have to stop ranting for today, but I want you to remember, you really only have three choices left. Give in and live like a serf. Fight back until you can't stand it anymore, or get out and take your freedom with you. This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio. I'll see you.